<laughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome to the talk show at the 92nd Street Y. And with us this evening is Congressman um, Eric Cantor. This is not uh, Eric Cantor's first visit to the 92nd Street Y. Uh, he was, let's see, three years ago he was on this stage. Uh, you know, he was a macher in those days. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was the re Republican uh, minority whip. And then look, he comes back the majority leader of the House of Representatives. This stage has been lucky for you. <laughs> I would buy a lotto ticket when you walk out of here. <clears throat> Three years from now, no, you could be Vice President Cantor in a Jeb Bush administration. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Jeb Bush is here in November, I'll mention that to you. <laughs> um, Speaking of machers, we should just begin because it's the appropriate thing. Le Shana Tova to you. Shana Tova. Gemar Hatima uh, Tova. Gemar Hatima Tova. Did you have an easy fast? Never, okay. never, but uh, it was all good. All, all good here with family. Actually, I uh, was here at Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre with friends and uh, family here in New York. Now, I'm quite sure that's the first time that that kind of a greeting was ever given to a House Majority Leader. <laughs> Probably a pretty good guess. I mean, yeah. can't imagine Lyndon Johnson, Sam Rayburn. <laughs> you know, like, what, Mr. Johnson, where did you get the Pesadica Gaviltafish? <laughs> so it's clearly the first time. Um, look, it's a 92nd Street Y. Yes, it's the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, but we've got to take care of the Jewish stuff, get that out of the way. Congressman Cantor and I will be speaking Yiddish for the next hour. <laughs> there will be a simultaneous translation. <laughs> By the way, you know, I've always wondered, have you ever been to the White House Hanukkah party? I have. Is it fun? Very. I was, and let me just, you, you may not, you know, you have issues with the man anyway, we'll talk about that later, but is, is President Obama good with the dreidel? <laughs> I would think he would be, because he's a lefty, and I think that's an advantage on the dreidel. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure he can hold his own. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, I don't think the dreidel is a, is a Republican thing, you know, because <laughs> these guys would never play with fake money. <laughs> the Democrats are good with guilt. Okay, um, let's start with the, the uh, item on everyone's uh, focus, everyone's agenda, Syria. Uh, as of the, over the last 24 hours, we've now learned that the United States and Russia have entered into an agreement that will avoid any military escalation or airstrike, uh, uh, military airstrike against uh, Assad's regime. Uh, President Obama today reported that this will lead to a much more lasting uh, resolution. Um, but the New York Times also reported today that it's almost impossible to imagine that this could all be accomplished in the year 2014, that to actually dismantle, recover, destroy all of those chemical weapons, in terms of Libya, took six years. Um, so just tell us, do you think that the, what, what, what do you know about the agreement? Are you satisfied with the agreement? We're going to talk about the events of this week as well. So I promise you we'll talk about the congressional authorization and why that never came about, but I'm just curious, what's your first impressions about the agreement? Well, I, I think none of us wanted to see uh, war. None of us like to even imagine missile strikes. Uh, very, just, I guess, an understatement to say unpleasant thoughts. But I'm really concerned about the direction that we're heading uh, with this agreement. And uh, just on the very simple level of analysis, what, what is happening is the U.S. national security interest now lies in the hands of Vladimir Putin. And that he will safeguard chemical weapons that Bashar al-Assad refused to even admit he had three days ago. And one could say that perhaps is maybe a flip answer, but I think it's very, very serious. And, and so much of this debate, Thane, was about chemical weapons, but so many of us felt strongly that really it is about the security situation on the ground in the Middle East, not only for U.S. interests, but for the interests of our allies, obviously for Israel, for Jordan, and the other Gulf countries, that really are worried about the growing influence of Iran, Hezbollah, and that nexus through Damascus. And this agreement 
basically says, now we have ceded the written authority, if you will, to the United Nations as to the use of force. Now the White House, Defense Department continue to say that that option remains if things don't work out. But not only is this about chemical weapons, I believe that the instance in Syria had a lot to do with American credibility. And there are many folks who say, well, it's just the president, he drew the red line, and this may relieve us of having to live up to that. But I can tell you many, many players in the region, from the Israeli government to the other Arab governments to the neighboring governments, as well as our worldwide allies and foes are watching because they know that America's word matters in the global system. And I'm worried now about the credibility of our word. Now, just uh, last week, uh, there were reports that you would have supported a congressional authorization uh, to uh, intervene and engage in a military airstrike against Libya. In fact, you even wrote an op-ed in one of the Virginia newspapers about this. So we're, we're, gonna get, we're gonna talk a lot more about Syria, so we'll get to Israel and Iran, but just tell us briefly, what when, before we had reached this world of diplomatic channels and there was some thought that America would actually engage in some offensive attack, what was your thinking in, in supporting the authorization? Because as you know, many other Republicans would have been opposed um, had the president actually gone before Congress. So just tell us, what was, it, was, it, what, was it essentially what you just said now about credibility, or was there more involved? If you look at, I think, our national security interests, which, frankly, I don't believe that this president did an adequate job of laying out before the country and building the case for why, why we should be involved in what some look at as just a Syrian civil war. And if, if you look at our national interests, yes, it is to end the Assad regime. Yes, it is to push back and against the growing threat uh, of Islamic militancy. And that's what it's about, whether it's on the Shia side or the Sunni side. Mm -hmm. So it is to stop the growing, uh, the, the growing influence of Iran and Hezbollah, is to ensure that Al Qaeda does not have a safe haven uh, in Syria to ensure that those weapons do not fall into the hands of the terrorist groups and proxies, uh, and uh, to make sure that moderation has an upper hand in the region, to tip the scales against those radicals, whether it's Bashar al-Assad and his forces, or whether it's the al-Nusra al-Qaeda strain uh, of activity in that region. And I believe that this agreement leaves all of that unattended. And again, I, I spoke about the sense of, or lack thereof, of allowing Vladimir Putin right. to make a mockery of American foreign policy and to then rely on his oversight of Bashar al-Assad and his weapons is clearly a client state of Moscow. Now, you can imagine how confusing it is for most Americans who don't live in Capitol Hill, right? Because we were told, well, there's a red line. And then we cross a red line, and then we're told that the president, on his own, would unilaterally authorize uh, a, a retaliation to send a strong message to President Assad. <clears throat> then we're told that we would really need a congressional authorization to do it. Uh, and we're going to seek, and the president will make his case uh, to Congress and to the people. Uh, we're told by uh, the administration that it would be, the attack itself would be impossibly small. I don't know exactly what that meant, but that doesn't seem very threatening when you tell someone, we're hardly gonna attack you. Uh, so don't worry, just sit and watch TV, it won't be bad. <laughs> so then we were told, I mean, it's confu I'm confused, and then we were told that we would never negotiate, it would never end through diplomacy because something needs to be done in a very active, aggressive way. And then of course we have diplomacy and Russia's leading the diplomacy and we're not even in this conversation. I feel like at next we're gonna to apologize to Syria uh, for calling attention to calling attention to their genocide. Right. Uh, because we're, I wanna be honest about what, we, what, we're, what the agreement actually does. Right. Um, 
So let's just start off with just some basic core questions that might help us. Did the president have the authorization on his own under the War Powers Act, in your opinion? I mean, you're the House Majority Leader. Of course you'd rather him come to you, Congressman Kanner, help me do this. But you know, he didn't ask for authorization for Libya when we assisted the, the, the French in that engagement. What, could he have done this? What changed his mind? You know, apparently the, it was 69%, I think was the uh, poll of Americans said that they thought that he needed to at least ask Congress's approval. 60% uh, said that they were, oh, 60%, I think it was the other way around. 60% they said they, they needed Congress's approval. 69% of Americans, New York Times reported, said that we should not be involved in Syria at all. It's like seven out of every 10 people. Well, let's start with the Constitution and then go to the War Powers Act. Uh, the Constitution, if anyone says that it's unconstitutional for the president to have acted, um, I think you can find as many constitutional scholars on either side of the issue, yes or no, constitutional. Uh, in the Constitution, as you know, it says that Congress can declare war, but it's our president that is the commander-in-chief of our armed forces. And so perhaps the framers of the Constitution purposely left things vague in order to bring about this tension between the branches of government. If you go to the War Powers Act, the War Powers Act says uh, that a president, if we are facing threat to the United States, uh, can undergo and commit our forces into action, but only gives the president 60 days right. by which he has to come to Congress to get authorization for that use of force. And as you know, Congress has the lever of the purse to afford the president the ability to carry out that mission. So I don't think it's fair to say one side or the other that it's black and white, sure. But I do think, again, going back to the mindset of the framers of our Constitution, that there was purposely left in there some tension. And in fact, uh, in the Constitution, it speaks to uh, the state's um, uh, authority mm -hmm. to wage war. Mm -hmm. And it gives Congress the ability to abridge that authority and list several exceptions from the state's perspective. But it specifically, in the Constitution, treats states' limited power of engagement in war, mm -hmm. but does not speak to the executive branch. Again, I think evidence that the founders of the Constitution expected this type of debate. Now, I looked this up. This is an interesting anecdote for your next cocktail party. Um, 18 times in American history, a president has gone before Congress to ask authorization to engage in some military action. And presidents are 18 and 0. They have never been refused in the history of this country. It's pretty clear that your brethren on, in Congress would not have approved this authorization. You would have. You, President uh, Obama surely would have come to you, Eric, uh, Congressman Cantor, help me. But it's clear here that... And he did. And I'm sure he did. And we're going to talk about he called APEC too, which you got to love. Uh, but we'll talk about that s at some point. But what, what, what among your both Republicans and Democrats, what was the thinking, the mindset? I mean, uh, are they acting simply because they knew that the polls said that 70% of Americans didn't think we should be engaged? We're hearing the words war-weary Americans. Um, why do you think, and also among Republicans, forget the Tea Party for a second, but among Republicans, I thought you guys were muscular in your foreign policy. You know, that you thought that Americans' presence should be to be forthright and active in the global sphere. So tell us, what, what was happening on Capitol Hill that forced the president to think, this is another road I can't go down? Well, first of all, um, you know, I think to put in context, you can see that over the last year, Israel has actually been in Syria three times in the air, taking care of business, taking out weapons, transports, and the rest. And it's interesting to look at the contrast. Israel does not announce that it's doing it. It does it, <laughs> and it won't admit it did it afterwards. <laughs> so, just, I, 
put that out there as examples of leadership versus what we are experiencing here. And, you know, You, you know, the last time you were here, I said, who knew there were this many Jewish Republicans in New York? But they're, they're, they show up. So what happened is somehow the White House made that decision. And I know there's been some coverage of the story about the president walking around the White House grounds two weeks ago Friday to make the decision that he was going to go to Congress with his uh, chief of staff, Dennis McDonough. The interesting thing that happened was we all got calls to come to the White House the next day after when the president announced that he was going to seek congressional authorization. But I think the interesting, interesting fact is no one, at least in the House, on the majority side of the aisle, got a call even to inquire as to what the vote prospects were. And that strikes me, really, as just very disconnected with the way that things work. And because we don't, we're not members of Congress or are we in the executive branch, that kind of thing can happen, right? They do Should that. happen. A West Wing guy calls up your staff. Not only that, the president certainly uh, called the speaker to tell him that he was going to go on TV, this was Saturday morning, to announce I see. The, uh, the act of seeking authorization, as well as to let us know in the leadership that we would be expected to attend a cabinet room meeting that following Tuesday. And again, the decision was made. There was no consultation to sort of sense what kind of reaction there would be. And you correctly suggest that I was, um, was in support of granting the president that authority, mm -hmm. because I feel so strongly about America's role in the world. Mm -hmm and America's role for good in this world, and the fact that there is um, really almost a binary situation that's been created in that region. You have the growing threat of Islamic milita militancy in Tehran on the Shia end. You have a lot churning, certainly in Egypt and throughout the region, Hamas on the Sunni end, and in Syria and elsewhere. And you've got Israel, Jordan, and some of the other allies that are looking for a force for moderation, a force for security. Now, there's a lot of differences between what we in Israel stand for and those other governments, honest, obviously, in terms of standing up for free speech, protecting minority rights, protecting and enhancing democratic culture. Obviously, a lot of differences. However, there's one thing that unites those allies and Israel with us, and that is a strong stance against what is coming out of Iran, which is an existential threat, not only to Israel, but to U.S. interests in the region as well. And I felt very strongly, if there was going to be any credibility for those allies of ours, as well as foes in the region and beyond, that America was going to stand by its word on the question of Iran and its quest for nuclear capability, that this was a time for us to stand up. Now, <clears throat> when it came to the other, my colleagues, I want to announce one is here tonight. I know Carolyn Maloney, and we're in her district. Carolyn, wherever you are, welcome, and thanks for coming. So, I, I can tell you, on the, on the left side of the spectrum, there are a lot of folks who don't think military options should be employed. And that gave the president his challenge on that side of the aisle. Because those are, those are his people. Those are his people. As we know, he, he, he was elected with a lot of support from those who would probably move to defund a lot of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Now, on our side of the aisle, you're right. I think that there is a strong strain of national security that America leads by peace through strength, mm -hmm. that the deterrent effect of a strong America and living by its word, by its allies, is a very influential element. And what happened, though, is when the president called the members back to Congress, and we had probably the largest 
classified briefing of the entire house I've ever attended, hmm. as well as the additional briefings that one gets. This was the group, and it was the whole cast of the administration that was involved. And the problem then, as the problem when the president addressed the country, I don't believe he adequately laid out the case as to why America has a national security interest in degrading Mr. Assad's ability to use and transport chemical weapons, and did not make the case adequately for why America's credibility was on the line and why it was going to be damaging if we couldn't live up to it. In addition, in the various meetings that took place, and publicly, this president did not lay out what would happen if the strike wasn't effective. What then? Very difficult situation. But you can see many of our allies, led by France, were very much engaged in supporting the moderate rebels. And there is a lot that could be done in that arena, but this president had refused to take the position that that discussion, for real, training, arming of those individuals should ensue. So without having made the case, what that said to the Republican side of the aisle was that we're really just doing this to almost check the box so that we can say we held up our credibility on that red line. And again, I would say it's much more than upholding credibility or international norms. This is about the national security interests of the United States. Let me ask you, it's a little tougher way of looking at this, and we don't ask our political leaders questions like this. Yes, you've, you've made the case, you've said it's our strategic interests to have engaged Syria in this way. We have to show Hezbollah and Iran that a red line means a red line. We need our allies to know that we stand by our word, that we are indeed watching their back. Uh, but I wonder also whether there isn't just simply moral accountability and moral responsibility, which is a separate issue, altogether different. I mean, I don't know whether, you know, I don't know whether Congress thinks this way, that we want to stand for something. You know, in the United States, if you commit a crime, we don't just go take away your guns and say, don't do it again. I mean, this is, I just can't imagine being a relative of the 1,400 people who were gassed. Now, in this room, where there are a number of Jews, there's a special sensitivity to gas. And it seems odd to me that we're sort of feeling somewhat triumphant today that we avoided engagement with Syria, but we never said to a country, you can't gas your own people or any other people. We never send that message. We're just saying, we don't trust you with gas. So you have to give us back your gas, but we never actually punish anyone. And I don't know, it's something you didn't mention, but do you think America, in terms of our foreign policy, we should also be interested in spreading the, the, the concept of moral responsibility and moral accountability? Thane, I, I really think it comes down to this. America is a force for good. And let us not forget that. Because if it were not for American leadership, who would take that moral position? Who would have the ability to deliver on the accountability end of that equation? Right. I don't think that we could come up with many, if any at all. And this strikes to the core of what this issue is about. Who are the people, who are the families there who have suffered that loss going to look to? And you can think of many examples around the world of people struggling in their confrontation with tyranny, with God forbid chemical weapons, who do they look to? They've got to look to America. I mean, I shudder to think, and of anybody, the Jewish people understand this, shudder to think about a repeat of mass annihilation and if America were not there to stand up. That is what this is about. And frankly, that is why I'm very, very concerned about the next three years, because we are going to live in a very dangerous time. Congressman Kanner, it's clear in listening to you how passionate and eloquent you are on the subject. You, despite what Vladimir Putin would say, you believe in American exceptionalism. 
you're, you're not troubled by it. I mean, it's interesting. It was, there was an irony that Putin was mocking President Obama, but it's not clear that President Obama believes in it. Uh, I mean, given what he said, I mean, it's not really what he thinks America should be in the business of doing. You're saying who, who but us should be in the business of doing this? Well, you look at sort of what President Obama has said in the past about American exceptionalism, and look at what Mr. Putin said the other day in the New York Times op-ed. So President Obama, as we know, has said in the past that American exceptionalism is really no different than a Brit living in Great Britain thinking that they're exceptional, or a Greek living in Greece thinking that they're exceptional, or a Frenchman thinking that France is exceptional that that's just who we are. Anybody would think their own country is exceptional. Not the Finnish people. The Finland people don't say that. <laughs> no, you ever been to Finland? They don't think much of themselves. But anyway, go ahead. So it, it is, it, it, it is uh, this is where the president comes down. So in, in the article that Mr. Putin wrote, he says no country should feel it's exceptional for any reason or any cause that it might pursue. Well, that is where he gets it wrong. We're not exceptional because we are that force for good. We are for the good. We are for moral accountability because we are exceptional. That is the essence of why this is such a blessing to be an American and actually to be a Jew in America because let us never forget, this country was the first country to ever grant us full citizenship of any in the world. And remember, it came from George Washington's letter right. to the Jewish community of Rhode Island expressing that sentiment that as a people of exile throughout the ages would not have to feel like strangers in this land. Again, we are for the promotion of good and moral clarity because we are exceptional. So you're obviously troubled when you hear terms of art such as leading from behind or second-rate power. To you, this is an abhorrent idea that in the last five years in your mind, we have slipped. We were late on Libya. We let the French go first. It's not clear how we've handled the Syria question this, this, this troubles you on this part of the aisle. I suspect you're not alone among Republicans who feel that it, we, won't, we don't want to accept being a second-rate power. We want to remain exceptional. There, there's no doubt. And I, I think it, it, you, know, you can tell by my sort of intensity of my passion on this issue of Syria. I, I really am worried about what it pretends for the future in, in the U.S. role as we face hurdles being erected by China, by Russia, by others at the UN? When has it ever been a body that stood for the kinds of things that we stand for or that ever gave the state of Israel a fair shot? Never. And so if we are not to lead, you can see the message that Vladimir Putin gave was that we should be for the preeminence mm -hmm. of the international community, right. and that we're all people belonging to that. I'm very, very troubled by that, and yes, I think there are many in this country that are very troubled by that attitude. So 70% of Americans say that we shouldn't be the world's policemen anymore. They're tired of this. Um, let me ask you another trickier question about Syria. Well, let, let, let me just say something there, too. I'm not saying that America's got to get involved in and can't afford to get involved in every instance of injustice in the world. It certainly should be something that bothers us all. But clearly, an instance where you're involved with the Iranian threat, the central nervous core, nor nervous system of terrorist financing, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with something like that and the prospects of a nuclear powered Iran. That's a serious question for world stability. That is something that America should be involved in and should stop. But you're concerned about Islamic radicalism, but it's very tricky with Syria. It's not, in, in listening to you tonight, I wonder, well, maybe this is really not just about honoring our commitments, but making sure that Iran understands what red lines are. Because let's not forget, you know, these insurgents in Syria, 
I mean, many of them are Al-Qaeda, many of them are Sunni militants, many of them are Muslim Brotherhood. You know, in, in America, it's fascinating. You know, we're so obsessed when we think of Tahrir Square in Egypt, we just immediately assume that these are all a bunch of kids with their Facebook pages, you know, and tweeting. But then you see what's actually in Cairo. It's not actually just tweeters and Facebookers. Uh, there's something else that's sort of a radicalized element. It doesn't, it's not clear to me we have friends on either side of the Syrian conflict, and yet you would say, you know what, we should still engage in some military airstrike. Well, let me speak to the Syria and Egypt right then. Uh, it's correct that there are... Uh, I mean, these are unsavory characters right. at it, best. It is correct that there are Al-Qaeda-linked, Al-Nusra uh, opposition rebels, and there are government Assad forces, both of whom, as I said earlier, represent that radical strain of, um, of Islam mm -hmm. uh, that are fighting one another. And you, you've heard the saying that was said, well, just let Allah resolve it. Let them kill themselves. Well, the problem is one of them will prevail, <laughs> and which means you've got a radical force yet even stronger. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to what our interests are, we want to counter the growing influence of Hezbollah in Iran through Damascus, but we also want to ensure that there's no safe haven mm -hmm. for al-Qaeda in Syria, which is why the move by our allies led by France, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and others to begin to work with and train the moderates is something that needs to happen because otherwise one of our enemies will prevail. Now, to your point about these are, these are all supporters of democracy and they're all on Twitter and Facebook and Tahrir Square in Egypt, well, I think that somehow along the way, we Americans often will stand up in public for anything that looks like democracy. But I think the lessons learned in Egypt, certainly in Gaza, and in other parts of the region, is democracy is not just an election. We've got to, as a nation, as a global superpower, insist on supporting the institutions that promote democracy, the political parties, the rights of minorities, of women, of people seeking the same kind of rights to freedom of expression, the transparency of the judiciary. All those things don't happen unless you've got strong political institutions and parties behind it. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of missed opportunity on the part of American foreign policy so far as the support for those things. And in the interim, you have in Egypt really two options for the short run. You're going to have either a secular dictator or an Islamist dictator. Which one is better? Again, two choices that aren't necessarily good choices. But if we're serious about securing U.S. interest and that of our allies, Israel and others, we ought, to make, we ought to make that decision bearing that in mind. All right, last question that has a Syrian bent. Um, so if you were uh, President, if you were Prime Minister Netanyahu, would you think, given the events of these diplomatic maneuverings, that it, the United States actually has Israel's back? And do you think that this will give Netanyahu more of a sense that he might have to act unilaterally on Iran because he's not sure whether red lines are kept, and he's not sure that he can actually rely on America's word. You know, I was in Israel about three weeks ago. Um, every other year, I uh, co-lead a trip for uh, con members of Congress, most of whom um, are freshmen. Uh, this is a trip that's sponsored by APAC's foundation. We had 28 members there. Uh, most of their spouses came along. My wife, Diana, who's here, was also there with me. And, you know, we met with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And he was very, very clear about what the threat was that Israel faced. The first, second, third, fourth, and fifth priorities was Iran. And Iran's quest for nuclear weapons capability. 
And you're right, Thane. It troubles me greatly to even imagine what Bibi Netanyahu now has to consider given the outcome of this Syrian incident. Does he or can he afford to wait? And as we know, given the proximity of the, na of the enemies, given the sheer size of Israel, there's no margin for error. And I think those of us in America who believe strongly that Israel's security is inextricably tied to errors, that Israel's on the front lines of this war against militant Islam, we better think long and hard about what we do as members of this great democracy to ensure that if something happens, that yes, we would be there to have Israel's back. All right, let's move on to another subject. Uh, October 1st is looming, as we know, uh, and so the, the possibility of another fiscal cliff is upon us, uh, another sequestration scenario. By the way, I don't exactly know what sequestration means, um, but it's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I know like I'm watching CNN and I hear, you know, Wolf Blitzer say sequestration. I, I always turn. I just want, <laughs> you'll see, you'll notice it from now. It's a, I don't know what it means, but I'm always finding it very exciting. Um, so we want to avoid this sequestering. See, it's very exciting. Uh, we want to avoid this. And so the way to avoid this, the president, Congress says to the president, look, we'd like you to engage in some meaningful uh, deficit reduction uh, and, uh, and some fiscal you know, responsibility, austerity, or discipline. And the president is saying, could you raise the debt limit? Uh, otherwise, we're careening into the sequestration fiscal cliff problem. Uh, I know it was just a week ago that you actually proposed a plan, uh, but apparently was off the table because everybody's mind was on Syria, and this had to do with somehow providing some kind of spending stopgap provisions, but it also included some kind of suspension or surrendering for a moment of the Obamacare. So can you at least explain to us, you know, we're told that this is again looming October 1st, another fiscal cliff. There's some anxiety in this room about this, although I'm told the government really doesn't actually shut down. Instead, you have sequestration, see? Uh, so tell us, explain to us what we expect to see between now and October 1st. Well, sequestration, I know that's just a riveting thought. It really is. Um, but it, it is across the board cuts. That's what it is, right? And this was the result of the difficulties surrounding the discussion of the debt ceiling two years ago. And it imposes is arbitrary across the board cuts that aren't the way you'd run your business. You wouldn't necessarily say, let's cut off funding for the good programs the same way you cut off funding for the bad. But it doesn't deal with Social Security, right, or Medicare, or does it include? Uh, a little bit of Medicare, a little. but mostly not. Right? And, but it does take, uh, takes, it definitely reduces the spending on defense. Disproportionately. For, sh for, for sure. Disproportionately, okay. yes. So that really doesn't preclude a shutdown. What would preclude a shutdown is if Congress didn't come to an agreement I see. Uh, with the White House on the way forward. Now, needless to say, there is still a lot of frustration in America, not just in Congress on the Republican side of the aisle, but in America about what Obamacare means mm -hmm. and what it holds for the future. Now, all along since the discussion when the law was passed, you know, we Republicans have been warning that premiums will go up. Right. I think it's fair to say that's going to be across the board, most especially for the younger uh, population that we'll see in my area. Um, there was a study done, and I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and uh, in my area, a 40-year-old male non-smoker will experience, as an individual, 60% increase in premium costs come January 1. And that will be made public come October 1 when the exchanges mm -hmm. are put up online. So we've been saying all along, this is not going to be a good thing as far as costs. Mm -hmm. We've also been saying that it's a real job killer because employers where most Americans outside the government programs get their insurance, employers are going to see a real uptick in their bottom line cost. 
And because of the way Obamacare is structured, what we're seeing now is an exaggerated growth in part-time jobs and a loss of full-time jobs. And if you look at the law, that's because Obamacare says that if you reach the equivalent of 50 full-time employees, then you are required to comply with the mandates of the law. Well, what does full-time amount to? 29, uh, 30 hours. So now, there are a lot of employers in America who have said, well, we're not going to be hiring as many full-timers, which means we've got to keep everybody at 29 hours a week. This has prompted so many in the union movement to get very, very upset, because now no longer can you count on that full-time week of 40 mm -hmm. hours. So there is a lot of angst, and we believe strongly now's the opportunity to tell the president, look, you've given businesses some exemption from the mandates. You've given insurance companies exemptions from the mandates. And even though the unions are upset, they've still gotten some exemptions. Mm -hmm. What about the working people? We ought to have a delay of this law because it's not ready, in the words of the president, it's not ready in those instances for prime time. Most of us believe, and, and on our side of the aisle and in the House, it's not ready ever for prime time. So we've got, to, we've got to work that out. Now, the president has said he doesn't want to negotiate over any of this stuff. He said it's a non-starter, right? Doesn't want to negotiate. Well, history will tell you that when there's divided government, there is usually agreement to correct some of the fiscal imbalances. And those discussions usually occur when the debt ceiling question comes up. That debt ceiling is coming up in the middle of October mm -hmm. to the end of November, uh, end of October. And so if you look at history would say Graham Rudman Hollings, the Budget Control Act, the Budget, uh, the Congressional Review Act, three examples right there where you've got in recent memory mm -hmm. resolution between the parties where you come together and you resolve things. This president and the administration have got to come forward to talk to us so we can resolve things. Now this raises a much more fundamental question that we've all been dealing with for years, watching the rancor and fractiousness, the course in debate between the parties and the president and the Republican Party. What is it with President Obama and the Republican Party? I mean, what, what is this? We're, we, we are told we now live in a post-racial society, so it can't be that. Um, <laughs> what? There's a racial problem? <laughs> it can't be that. It's never raced. Um, is it a clashing personalities? I mean, we've seen in American history, uh, Tip O'Neill worked with Ronald Reagan, Newt Gingrich worked with, uh, with President Clinton, uh, Boehner and Obama not so much, uh, or, or not at all. Uh, I know I'm, I'm asking such a loaded question, but who's to blame here? Well, look. First of all, let me say, there's so, there's so much blame to go around, not necessarily, I think, a productive exercise. But I will say this. Um, I did not serve with the Clinton administration, uh, but I know very well, as you point out, uh, there was a lot of disagreement. There was a disagreement over taxes back then. Right. There was disagreement over spending back then. Welfare reform. There was disagreement over welfare reform back mm -hmm. then. But somehow, there were deals and there were agreements that were arrived at because parties sat down to talk. And that's just not happening now. And to give you an example, just last week, you know, I have had the ability to develop a relationship with our vice president hmm. and have done so since for the last two years when we were thrust together, if you will, because of the Biden commission that the president mm -hmm. formed. And the speaker asked me to go and meet with the vice president and that lasted for about seven weeks, three times a week, for about two and a half hours every day. And Joe Biden is a man that is certainly willing to communicate. And <laughs> he is one who understands sensitivities politically mm -hmm. and gets the human relationship side. Mm -hmm. And last week, he called me and said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you've got yourself in quite a bind. And 
they, he and the administration were beginning to call members of Congress, Republicans, down to the White House into the Situation Room to talk about Syria. And I noticed back then, last week, that was the first time this administration has done that in the five year, nearly five years it's been in office. Mm. The first time that rank-and-file Republicans were asked to come down to the White House, when we say rank-and-file outside of leadership, to come to the White House to engage in a discussion at all. This is, to me, Thane, what is missing in Washington. When two people exist and there is disagreement, you have to, as people, find ways to set those disagreements aside and find a way to work together in common. And unfortunately, the dialogue is just not there. I believe we can do a lot better. And I have pled with this White House, with the Vice President, to please impose upon the President to do more of that. Because I do think we could do better and get really some progress. All right, a few more questions before we take some from the House. Um, here's something that hasn't helped even the Republican Party, the Tea Party. Um, you know, you may not remember this, you know, I mean, I just sit around for years waiting for you to come back. You know, you, you have a life and you're a mocker. So I, I will tell you, I will tell you what you said in 2010. And you said this, I, I said, you know, the, the Tea Party had just, midterm elections had just taken place and you were here at the Y maybe three weeks later. So it was all fresh. And I said to you, I said, Congressman Cantor, I said, so what do you think about this Tea Party? You think you'll be able to work with them? And you said, oh yeah, I think it'll work well. I think we'll be able to work, they'll be able to work with traditional Republicans. And, you know, Senator McCain calls them wacko birds. Uh, <laughs> and he's right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and, and you know that he's right, but you can't say that. I mean, there's, there's, and I'm not going to make you say that, but, but it's, 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 it is a difficult situation, right? Three years have gone by, and it does, the, Syria was a very good example, right? You could not count on that piece of the Republican Party for votes in, the, in, in any kind of intervention in Syria, correct? I mean, they, in this case, they're either purely internationalist in their focus, and say, look, we don't fight wars away from America. We don't deal with interests that are beyond our own. Uh, I'm going to push back a little bit Good. on the premise of your question. Okay. Because I bet what I said last time when we were here, I, would, I said, number one, remember who the Tea Party is. Tea parties were, right. were moms, were grandmoms, were working men and women who really had not engaged in the political discourse before. Right. And they gathered around... This, mon this sort of moniker, taxed enough already. That's what Tea Party, if we recall that, that's what it stands for. Out of utter frustration that their voices were not being heard and that what was going on in Washington at the time, and it was the passage of Obamacare and uh, a lot of the regulatory things that were going on at the time, as well as things in the House, that's what sparked that so-called movement. Mm -hmm. And so remember, that's really the origin of the group. But three years later? And throughout the country back then, people mm -hmm. took to the town squares mm -hmm. to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. That's what the framers envisioned about our country, is the government works for the people. So now you say, well, that was Tea Party, this was Tea Party. I, I just think that unfortunately, the characterization by the media has been misportraying, if you will, so many of those individuals, those moms and grandmoms and dads who were part of that effort in 2009. Because honestly, we've got more agreement than we've got disagreement uh, within our party. Our party has always been one that likes to sort of rally around the principle of limited government, of pro-growth economics, of upward mobility, which means affording equal opportunity to everybody, not guaranteeing an outcome. And I think that's really what all those within our party, the Republican Party, would say. We are a party that stands for a country of opportunity. And there are a lot of folks who are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder 
who may not have the right tools to even get up on the first rung of that ladder. Mm -hmm. And certainly, the conservative ideals that we stand for should afford those individuals a safety net if they need it, mm -hmm. and only those who need it, as well as the skills necessary so they can begin to climb that ladder. And there's just a difference. There's a difference with the other side. Mm -hmm. And the other side doesn't necessarily believe that all that is right, mm -hmm. because as we've seen in the mayoral elections in this city, I'm watching from afar, but I've watched what's been going on in the primary here, and unfortunately, the maligning of success, saying that those people at the top of the ladder somehow are just bad people and somehow have made too much at the expense of those at the bottom. And the primary com uh, contenders say that somehow government should step in, take from those at the top, give to those at the bottom, so everybody meets in the middle. We don't believe that. We believe it is about upward mobility and the ability to rise. And that's what this country affords people more than anywhere else in the world. And so, yes, there is discussion. There is frustration uh, within our party because we can't seem to get the two, the White House and the Senate, to go along with what we want. Mm -hmm. But again, <laughs> but again, that's just natural. That's what happens. I mean, read your history books. Mm -hmm. there's, been, there's been people shot because of debates ongoing in the House, in the Capitol. Fortunately, we are not there, <laughs> right? But, but again, we need robust debate of ideas, exchange of ideas in this country. Uh, and uh, again, all human beings at the end and all given this incredible opportunity and privilege to have the kind of discussion we do, mm -hmm. not only in Congress, but in a forum like this and others across the country. Well said. I still think they're wacko birds, but whatever. <laughs> but that is an excellent answer, actually, uh, Congressman. Um, I, have one, I have one final question. I have one final question of Congressman Cantor, and then we'll take a few questions and we'll say goodnight to our good friend, Congressman Cantor. My question is, uh, what's next for you? Uh, you know, you've, this was a meteoric rise. You only came to uh, office 2001. Uh, you know, you've moved so quickly. Uh, speaker, uh, Senator Cantor, Vice President Cantor. Uh, do you have an end game in mind? And, and secondly, I wonder, because we are in New York and there are Jews in this room, I'm told. Uh, uh, is it strange? I mean, you're the only Republican Jew in Congress. Uh, you had another one, he got sick, I don't know what happened. Uh, there was two, now there's like two shuls, one guy closed. So, so uh, you're, you're alone. Are you, are you frustrated? Do you understand? I mean, it does seem like Jews are obsessed with the Democratic Party. 80% of them will vote for Democrats reflexively. They just vote, you know, they don't even think about it. You know, George W. Bush could arguably have been the greatest president in the history of the 66 years for Israel. And, you know, and 80% of the people voted for, you know, for John Kerry in 2004. Uh, and no matter what happens, it's 80%. You can't get off the dial. Uh, do you think about this often? Do you ever think, you know, we, can't we pick up another 10% of Jewish? <laughs> Even 70, would, 80 is embarrassing, you know, like, you're, and, you're, and you're such a great legislator, and you're alone, and you're the majority leader, for God's sakes. So. <laughs> What, what do you think about this? Is Trump does keep you up at night? Prozac? What? <laughs> Ask my wife and her democratically raised mother. I know the my mother. mother in law from Miami Beach right now. Does I know it the keep them up too? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is it's an interesting spot I'm in. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I represent a district that may have one, one and a half percent. Jewish population, um, grew up in a very traditional Jewish home, mm -hmm. uh, still trying to abide by the laws of kashrut uh, every day, even when I go to pig roasts and shrimp feasts. You know? <laughs> so, um, and it is something that obviously it's who I am. And yes, having grown up in a community with an active Jewish federation, community relations council, having served, my wife and I is 
as uh, local young leadership chairs mm -hmm. when we first got married, uh, engaging in discussion. Uh, and often I, found, I find myself, when we're with our, our friends that are Jewish, uh, on the other side of most. Mm -hmm. uh, but I um, feel very strongly that the Republican Party um, is a party uh, that stands for so much of what we're about. And I don't believe there's a monolithic Jewish position. Yes, the trends are, and always have been in this country, uh, that Jews vote more Democratic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I only say that how in the world could I be the majority leader of our party if our party somehow was not accepting of Jews? So, I think it's a healthy thing for us to consider with an open mind, tolerance of all. You know, again, you, 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 you mentioned Tea Party and you mentioned some of the derisive names that one would, some would apply. I don't think that that's helpful, Thane. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's helpful for anyone to be deriding others uh, because they are partaking of the privilege of democracy in this country. And, and, and I, I was so inspired by that, I want to apologize to the Tea Party. I, I do not think you're wacko, Burtz. <laughs> and, and again, I, I think, uh, yeah, so yes, it's frustrating to me, and yes, I will continue to try and espouse that message of opportunity. Again, I, I know that we may talk a little bit about um, sort of where my family came from. We're going to do it in a minute. Yeah. Not unlike many of yours, and it is this country and I believe, um, you know, our party that really stands for that. All right, let's take a, all right, excellent. <laughs> take a few questions, uh, a few questions, and I think I have a surprise for the speaker, I'm going uh, to, for our majority uh, uh, leader. Um, let me ask this question first. This, in this, you, you said kashrut, so I'm going to throw out another word here. This comes from our audience. In the spirit of tikkun olam, which is to repair or save the world, uh, don't Jews have a special calling to safeguard the natural world? Isn't global warming a tremendous disregard of that desire? Um, I, tikkun olam is something that all of us try and uphold, and as we just went through uh, the cleansing process of the High Holy Days of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, certainly I think a lot of us reflected upon maybe what we could have done better. And going back to my days in JCC nursery school, always taught to clean up your mess. And <laughs> I look at, you know, the whole issue of the environment through that lens. Yes, we should do everything we can to clean up the mess. However, that does not come for free. And if we're going to do so in any sustainable way, we have got to do so bearing in mind there are a lot of struggling people in this country of ours that don't have a job, that are looking for some hope so that their kids may realize the promise of this country even more than they did. And there is a balance. And what our party has stood for is really almost like a cost-benefit analysis. Yes, we want clean air, clean water. We want to protect the environment. But you can't do that if you can't afford to put food on the table. And if you look anywhere else in the world, I don't believe you'll find another country that does it any cleaner. And so we ought to be about prosperity and we ought to be about upholding the environment. And they're not mutually exclusive. All right, we're going to end in a moment, but I wanted to have the uh, Eric Congressman Cantor read something. Uh, I hope you'll be okay with reading this. This was a speech that you delivered uh, back in February in front of the uh, American Enterprise uh, Institute. The title of the speech was Make Life Work, and uh, in it you pointed out a number of policy prescriptions that the Republican Party and the country should be engaged in, whether it's education policy, uh, uh, health care reform, uh, tax reform, and even immigration reform. Um, and uh, it was a compelling speech, but particularly because this is the stage of the 92nd Street Y, 
I thought you should read these last two paragraphs, and if you, if you will indulge me and us. This was a speech you delivered uh, back in February of 2013. Sure. Uh, like so many of the generation living in Eastern Europe at the turn of the last century, my grandparents fled the vicious anti-Semitic pogroms of the czars of Russia to come to America. Widowed at a young age, my grandmother raised her two sons in a tiny apartment atop a grocery store she and my grandfather had opened. With little but her faith, thrift, thrift and hope for a better tomorrow, my grandma worked seven days a week to ensure that my dad and uncle could realize the promise of this great country. And today, my children and I stand as proof of the possibility to what may have seemed to her like an impossible dream. Wow. Congressman Cantor. Thank you. Congressman Cantor, you have a lot of friends in New York. Please know that. 